Hello, and welcome back to the Berkeley at Home Variety Show. I'm Patrick Holmes, and we have another great episode for you this week. Mike is back with a final update on the Peregrine Falcons. We take a visit to Planet Berkeley, and we continue our celebration of 150 years of women at Berkeley. But first, we want to continue our discussion of racism and anti-blackness. The popular Berkeley Conversations live video series featured an event titled Structural Racism in COVID-19, The Political Divide, Reopening the Society, and Health Impacts on People of Color. Associate Professor of Epidemiology Mahasan Mujahed said, as we're dealing with the polarized nature of a lot of what's going on, it's important that we listen to all sides, similar to how we need to listen to communities, listen more to marginalized groups, and make sure we do not have an elitist approach to what we're doing. And in a second event on Monday, Berkeley experts discuss race, law, and health policy. Berkeley law professor Kiara Bridges described a toxic combination of individual racism through implicit bias and structural racism that permeates the healthcare industry. These views lead medical professionals to make unintentional and ultimately harmful judgments about the care that they give people of color. But the disparity can't entirely be explained by implicit bias. That framework causes us to think of racism as a private concern, which in turn mitigates any responsibility that the state and society more generally has to the eradication of racism and racial inequality. You'll find links to recaps and recordings of both of these events down below. And in a video posted to Facebook, Black admissions staff speak out against racism and anti-Blackness and affirm that Black lives matter. This cannot be a moment and must be the movement. This cannot be a moment, but be the movement. This cannot be a moment and must be the movement. We now turn to Mike Durda for an update on the Peregrine Falcons. Thanks, Patrick. It's been a few weeks, so let's catch up with Redwood, Sequoia, and Poppy, our favorite trio of Peregrine Falcon siblings, currently nesting atop Berkeley's Campanile. About a month ago, after days spent literally stretching their wings and nervously peering over the edge of the tower parapet, the three birds took flight for the very first time. Redwood was the first to take to the skies on May 30th, followed by Sequoia and then Poppy shortly after. Several hundred falcon enthusiasts came to campus to watch the fledglings' first flights, and trained volunteers were on hand to provide assistance if the young birds were to get stuck in trees or on top of nearby buildings. Ultimately, though, the falcons performed marvelously. Since then, the now fully grown siblings have been practicing their aerial acrobatics and learning to hunt. They'll leave the nest for good in mid-July. Watching the falcons take the plunge off of the campanile for the very first time, I was reminded of the opening lines of one of my favorite poems, W.H. Auden's Leap Before You Look. The sense of danger must not disappear. The way is certainly both short and steep. However gradual it looks from here, look if you like, but you will have to leap. Back to you, Patrick. Thank you, Mike, for that last and final update. That's right, viewers. Our chief wildlife correspondent will be taking a leap of his own as he leaves the Berkeley nest and heads to a new job opportunity in Los Angeles. We'll miss you, Mike, just as we'll miss Poppy, Redwood, and Sequoia as you all leave the nest this summer. If shelter in place has you missing the sights, smells, and sounds of the Berkeley campus, then a new video series called Planet Berkeley has your fix. For more than 100 years, the fox squirrel has flicked its bushy reddish tail in the trees and on the lawns on the Berkeley campus. Our researchers have found that squirrels' moods are revealed through their tails, which move more rapidly when they are frustrated. Twice a year, they do a full body molt, and in the spring, they travel lightly. When the fall comes, you'll find them bustling around in their thickened coats, checking over their hidden caches of nuts. Better keep an eye on your snacks when you're eating outside. They are not afraid to take a nap right out of your hand.
be sure to check out the entire video series using the link down below. We had two perfect score winners for our last scavenger hunt, How Well Do You Know the Campanile? Joanne Sandstrom retired from the Institute of East Asian Studies, and Mike Riley is Executive Director of Berkeley Executive Education. Congratulations, Joanne and Mike, and be sure to check out this week's scavenger hunt where we ask the question, where's that bear? We continue our year-long celebration of 150 years of women at Berkeley with another dispatch from the 150W Executive Committee. Thank you, Patrick. Continuing our celebration of 150 years of women at Berkeley, who better to exemplify the incredible contributions of women than Barbara Christian? Barbara Christian was a trailblazer and pioneer in the growing debates over the relationship among race, class, and gender. Her work was primarily focused on African-American women's writings and feminist theory. In her widely cited article, The Race for Theory, she challenged those studying African-American literature to look beyond pure theory and to look closer at writers as individuals in their work. Barbara Christian started her journey at UC Berkeley in our English department in 1971. A year later, she was instrumental in establishing our African-American studies department. In 1978, she became the first African-American woman to be granted tenure at UC Berkeley. In 1986, she became the first to be promoted to full professor. In 1991, she received the university's Distinguished Teaching Award, the first African-American to do so. And then in 2000, she received the Berkeley Citation for distinguished achievement and for notable service to our university. As a dedicated teacher, she has impacted thousands of students. In fact, when PhD applicants applied for her department and they were asked who they wanted to work with during their graduate study, Barbara Christian was listed the most. She was a beloved teacher whose courses were filled with students of virtually all ethnic backgrounds. Her students exuded excitement, amazement, awe, respect, and love for her as a teacher, a person, and a friend. Christian was also a passionate activist and her commitment to the causes of justice and equality was unshakable. Thank you to Barbara Christian and all our Berkeley women. To learn more about our 150 years of women at Berkeley celebration, visit 150w.berkeley.edu. Back to you, Patrick. For all you creative folks out there looking for an artistic outlet during these stay at home times, be sure to check out the Berkeley Art Studios virtual classes. They're offering everything from homemade salt dough recipes to paper clay sculpture. Whether you are stuck in your apartment alone or at home with kids, these projects are suited for everyone. And speaking of art, UC Berkeley faculty and staff have many talents outside of their day jobs. Take Alex Schwartz, for example. She's the Director of Academic Planning in the College of Letters and Sciences and a local glass artist. We'll leave you with a video of Alex walking us through the process of making one of her kiln form pieces and a new segment featuring the talents of fellow Berkeleyans. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again soon. Hi, and welcome to my glass studio. My name is Alex Schwartz. I work in the College of Letters and Science, but in my spare time, I do kiln form glass. I'm gonna show you a little bit of how I made one specific piece. And this one is called Tuxedo. The piece we're gonna to make today is not gonna be exactly like that because no two pieces are alike. But you'll see, you'll get an idea of the steps. So let's go. Okay, this is how we cut a circle. You can see that score. Tap. This tool. Okay, once you've cut a bunch of circles, you're going to start stacking them up inside of a pot like this that has a hole in the bottom. And you just put your glass in there in the order that you would like the colors to come out in. Whichever colors on top is going to be in the center of your meringue. Once this is completely full, you'll put it up high in a vitrograph kiln. It's a small kiln that has a hole in the bottom that matches this hole. You'll bring the temperature up to 1510 and then the glass will be so molten that you'll be able to pull it out of that hole with a pair of pliers and just gradually pull it like pulling taffy slowly. Once you've done that and you've got a long cane almost touching the floor, you snip it off at the base of the pot and you'll have some long canes that are like this, only longer. Once the canes are cool, you're gonna snip them into lengths that you can work with like this. 
And then you're going to cut it into short lengths that you can make things out of. Just with a nipper. Okay, the marini we made today will look something like this. And the marini we'll use in today's project looks something like this. They're from an earlier batch and the center has a shape sort of like a leaf. I'm gonna put the last few pieces of marini in. You can see that the kiln has cooled down. And now the moment we've been waiting for. Open it up and see that the piece is nicely fused. Okay, well that's as far as I can get for today because um, the next step is to grind and polish, which I need to go to Bullseye Glass in Emeryville to do. As soon as this is all over and I get it all ground and polished, you'll be able to see this on my website and um, find out how it turned out. In the meantime, thanks for joining me today on Berkeley at Home.